This is the 54th message in a series on the person and work of Christ. And we're still studying some of the events that we refer to as the post-resurrection appearances. You remember in the book of Acts, it is said that Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs after his passion. It was not enough that he merely rise from the dead. He appeared over and over again to his disciples. He gave them every infallible proof, proof that could not be questioned, proof that could not be doubted. Somehow or another, it's a precious thing to me to see the carefulness of the Lord in removing every difficulty in the believer's heart. But believers do have difficulties in their hearts. There are times when they doubt. There are times when they cannot believe. There are times, like the Emmaus disciples, when they're discouraged. There are times, like Peter, when he went fishing, that they get disgusted and turn away from the course they know they should be taking. There are times when they're just not as strong as they ought to be, not as brave and not as bold. There are times when they react just exactly like sheep should frustrated, discouraged, perplexed, and I am so thankful as I've been studying these post-resurrection appearances for the faithfulness of the shepherd's ministry in finding these sheep wherever they were in their particular circumstances and ministering to their hearts, bringing them to full assurance and full confidence before he went back to heaven. And I, I think it's marvelous that his first concern was for his sheep, and that for 40 days and nights he was not just killing time, he was ministering to his bride, washing them and cleansing them with the water of the word, encouraging them, building them up, taking care of them, intercepting them when they walked away from him, watching over them, loving them, being patient with them. And I think all of these appearances are patterns. I think they are a bird's eye view of the age of grace, and I think we have in them the perfect and full revelation of what Christ is to his people in this time of his absence. All of us, as I've repeated to you before, have found ourselves in these various experiences. There are days when we are on Emmaus Road, discouraged, miserable slow of heart to believe the promises of God and going further and further away from the city of double peace, only to be intercepted by the Lord in the walk of life, encouraged by the word, our hearts set to burning again, and brought back to that place of peace that we had so early abandoned, and given such burning hearts that we are enabled to tell others that we had seen the Lord and met him in the way. And then there are times when we are like... Mary Magdalene, so lonely for the presence of the Lord that we will tarry like she did at the sepulcher, at the last place we had seen him. Tearful, crying out, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have taken him. Until he meet us, speak to us, convince us that he's not gone, that he is real, and send us back joyfully as he sent her to tell other disciples that she had seen the Lord and he had met her and talked with her in the way. Then there are times when we're like Peter, discouraged, and we go fishing. And our testimonies influence the lives of others, and they go fishing too. And we work, and we work, and we work, and we catch nothing in our nets. By morning comes, we can't even recognize the Lord, though he only stood 300 feet away on the shore. We're cold and naked and tired and worn out and nothing in our net for ourselves and nothing in our nets for others. And uh, we must be met by the Lord. And he called them back and he fed them at the fireside and he warmed them with that nice fire he had ready. And he restored them and he strengthened their hearts and made them to love him and encouraged them to follow him. And all of these experiences are indeed patterns. And we have another pattern this morning of the believer's life, and one which will indeed be familiar to every believer in the age of grace at one time or another. 
is the case of that man who is often referred to as Doubting Thomas. It's a very wonderful story about Thomas. It's actually in two parts. The part where he was not present in the meeting and the part where he was present in the meeting and the results of not being there and the results of being there are brought into vivid contrast. So if you'll read with me, I'd like to read at verse 19 of the 20th chapter of John for the first message this morning. And then tonight we'll continue in the same subject. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see, shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. That's where you and I fit into the story. We find ourselves in that verse. We are those more blessed than Thomas who have believed without seeing. And having never seen him, we have believed and rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory, which was more than Thomas could do at the moment. There's very little known about Thomas. Tradition says that he went to India finally and was attacked by a mob of heathen while standing on the temple steps preaching the gospel, that he was cast head first down those temple steps where all his brains were dashed out and he died a martyr's death. There is indeed a church in India today that bears his name, the Church of St. Thomas, in memory of this man, so tradition says, who came from the far-off city of Jerusalem to the land of India as his first missionary with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I suppose he has been best known down through the years of time for the nickname which someone hung on him many years ago, Doubting Thomas. He stands as an example, supposedly in men's minds, as the chief of doubters the skeptic who just couldn't believe until he had touched with his fingers and taken his hand and thrust it into the side of the Lord. I've often thought, after meditating a little on Thomas, that perhaps the phrase doubting Thomas was a little exaggerated. I think there was a greatness to his character that perhaps we've never known. I don't think it's a, a bad characteristic for a man to have to be a little skeptical about things as important as the wounds of Christ and the person of Christ. I don't think we ought to believe every religious Tom, Dick, and Harry who comes down the pike with some testimony about things eternal. And it may be that in all of Thomas's unbelief there was more faith than there is in some of us. For he knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. And he would settle for no one less 
than the Lord Jesus Christ, and I admire him in that. I'm glad that he was not willing to ride along on someone else's testimony and say, if you've seen him, that satisfies me. Thomas simply said in so many words, I must see him for myself. I must make an investigation that quiets the fears of my own heart. And when my questions have been answered and my doubts, my doubts have been set aside, then I too will believe. And I admire him in that. So many today ride along in the experience of others. And so true is this, and I hope you young people will hear it, in the lives of our children. You're raised in a Christian home. You come here to the assembly and you hear the word preached. And uh, there's a tremendous tendency for you to ride along on the testimony of your parents, on the experience of your parents, and on the experience and testimony of the assembly itself. And I think one of the great deceptions in this particular circumstance is in deceiving you into thinking that because you mingle with Christian people, because you live in a Christian home, or because you hear so often the word and the testimonies of others, that this necessarily is your testimony and your experience, and it may not be so at all. I think, and I know this sounds like a paradox, but I still believe that under the sound of the word, in a New Testament Bible-believing and Bible-preaching testimony, in a Christian home, perhaps, may be an easy place to go to hell. It would seem like it would be the hardest place to go to hell. But yet the unpardonable sin, which is a final and ultimate rejection of the testimony of God's Word, can only be committed while under the sound of God's Word. For no man can ultimately and totally reject the testimony of the Holy Spirit until he hears it, and unless he hears it. And so I would warn you young people who are in Christian homes, who come here often to the assembly, don't ride along on the testimony of others. Because some brother testifies, I have seen the Lord. He is indeed risen and living. Don't say, that satisfies me. If he's seen the Lord, then I too believe. Be like Mary Magdalene. Even though others may come and investigate and leave again, you stay until Jesus is made known to you, made real to you. And you can come away saying, I don't know what others have seen, but I have seen the Lord, and my heart rests in that knowledge of Him. So there's lots of good things to say for Thomas, isn't there? Besides just calling him a doubter. As we look into his character a little this morning and more tonight, I think this brother would grow up on and although I never like to excuse the sins of a man, and he did commit sin, this awful sin of not mere unbelief but disbelief, yet I'm comforted in such stories as the story of Thomas by the mere fact that he, a man of flesh and blood and bone like me, who walked with the Lord, who heard him personally, who had seen him with his own eyes, if he could fall in such a snare, be in such desperate need so few days after Calvary, how much more do I need to be on guard? And how much more do I need to be reassured by the Lord as he reassured Thomas? Then I see that when I experience the same thing, that I am not alone, that this strange trial that comes upon my faith from time to time was known to Thomas and was known to others. And that the Lord did not abandon him, and the Lord will not abandon me. And the Lord would not leave him faithless, but made him believing. And the Lord will not leave me faithless, but he will make me believing also. And so all of these things are an encouragement to my heart. Now let's look first of all and what the testimony of the Scripture gives in regards to Thomas. There are only four mentions of him in the entire New Testament. Yet in these four mentions of Thomas, 
I think there are some characteristics given that give us a good idea of what kind of man he was. First of all, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 10:13, we have the simple statement that he was one of the original twelve apostles. He was chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ out of many. Many, perhaps, were called, but only twelve were chosen. I read, and I'm impressed with this, that before the twelve were ever called, the dear Lord gave himself to an entire night in prayer. He went alone into a mountain place, and he prayed the entire night through in preparation to the calling of his disciples. And then on the following day, he called those twelve men, eleven who would remain his apostles throughout eternity, one who was a son of perdition from the beginning, yet indeed chosen of Christ just as surely and just as really. And if that be hard to understand, then reconcile it with the simple fact that Jesus needed the ministry of Judas. One must betray him, one must fulfill the scriptures, and one must deliver him into the hands of the Jews to be crucified. It need not have been Judas. Judas was not named in the Old Testament as that one who would betray. Only one who had lifted up their hand in communion with him would then lift up their heel. It could have been Thomas. It could have been Peter. It could have been Matthew. It could have been Bartholomew. Judas was not doomed and damned by predestination and by some unchangeable word of God before his birth. He was not damned from his mother's womb. He took the way he chose to go. And Jesus warned him faithfully down through his experience with him, Woe unto that man that betrays me. Better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the sea. So Judas need not have betrayed him, but he chose to, and so sealed his own destiny and went to his own place. But these men were chosen by prayer, with careful deliberation, and so the Lord lovingly considered Thomas in prayer. Thomas was a man prayed for, a man prayed for by the Lord Jesus Christ and given the high privilege of being numbered with a twelve. We don't see anything of Thomas's personality until we come to the 11th chapter of John. And you remember they were going along one day, and some messengers came and told Jesus the sad news that a man he loved very much by the name of Lazarus was sick. He said, Won't you come, Lord? He's sick, and you know you love him, and he's sick unto death. So Jesus doesn't hurry. He tells them that this sickness is for the glory of God and that he doesn't need to go just yet because Lazarus is not really sleeping, or not really sick, but he is asleep. Now when he makes all move to go to Bethany to Lazarus, the disciples begin to object mildly because just recently they had been down there. And the Jews had attempted to stone the Lord Jesus and had threatened to take his life. And they were concerned and they pled with the Lord and said, Lord, you know that the Jews almost killed you when you were there before. Don't go back. But he said he had to go because of Lazarus. But I see Thomas standing back, meditating on all of these things. He was a very practical man. I don't think he was as much a pessimist and a doubter and a scoffer and a skeptic as perhaps he's been painted. I think he was a very thoughtful and a very deliberate man in his thinking. And he came to the conclusion while the disciples were discussing the danger that would present itself to the Lord. He came to the conclusion that there was no way to escape it. That Jesus was slated to die destined to die, and that's all there was to it. And so he spoke up and said as much, and this is what he said. 
he said that the Lord would go down there to be killed, to be delivered unto death. And he said, I will go that I may die with him, or let us go that we may die with him. Now there are two things that proves to me about Thomas. First of all, that he loved the Lord Jesus very much. If he had not have loved the Lord Jesus, he would have abandoned him right there. After coming to a carefully considered decision that death awaited Jesus and obviously those who were associated with him, he could have just said, you know, I have an awful headache. I don't believe that I'll go to Bethany with you. I'm not feeling too well and I have some things at home to attend to. He could have made a graceful exit at that particular moment and said, I'll see you fellows later. Don't call me, I'll call you. But he could not do it. He was like Paul, the love of Christ constrained him. And he made the announcement, and the only one who did, let's go down and die with him. And that proves to me that the Lord Jesus Christ was the Lord of Thomas's life and heart. All his life was tied up in Jesus. To him, if Jesus died, he just as well died too. If there be no more Lord, Thomas doesn't care to go on in his life. All his hopes and all his dreams and all his life is tied up with Jesus. He doesn't understand Calvary. He doesn't understand the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the ascension into glory. He doesn't understand that first the sufferings must come and then the glory. All he sees is a tragedy. He sees the cross. He foresees the Lord's tragic death. And he says, if Christ must die, then I must die too. And that indicates to me the pureness of Thomas's heart, the great love of Christ, the devotedness of his heart, the great fact that Christ was not only his Savior, Christ was his Lord, and everything Thomas was found its fulfillment in what Jesus was. And that's some good things to say about a man. And his willingness to die for Jesus. There was no idle threat. Thomas meant every word of it. If he dies, I will go die with him. Then, the next glimpse we have of Thomas, which is very brief, is when Jesus is on the very threshold of fulfilling that prophecy Thomas made of him, that he would die. It's in the upper room, in the Passover chamber, the night before the crucifixion. They were celebrating the last Passover together, then as they came to that final cup of blessing, and Jesus took it, but he proposed a new toast in connection with that final cup of blessing. It was not for the coming of Elijah, which was ordinarily the meaning of that last cup in the Passover, but he said, this bread it's, is my body, which is given for you, and this, this cup, it is my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. And he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. And they partook in silence of that communion. Their hearts undoubtedly gripped with perplexity, with fear, with frustration at the thoughts that soon he must leave. And so he began that most famous talks where he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, now believe also in me. And in my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And now I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, ye may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And uh, you remember that in this conversation that followed, Philip wanted to see the Father. He desired to see God face to face. But Thomas was content for one thing, and that was just to be wherever Jesus was. 
For Thomas spoke up and he said, Lord, we know where you're going, but we don't know the way. How can we know the way? And it was Thomas that Jesus answered when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is another little glimpse into the heart of Thomas. Now what do we see there? Jesus had said to the disciples generally, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. And I like Thomas, he's not willing to sit there and pretend like he knows the way. He wants to make doubly sure of the way, because wherever Jesus is, he wants to be there. So he speaks up. The others were content to just sit there and pretend like they knew the way, but not Thomas. He spoke up and said, Lord, we know perhaps where you're going, but we don't know the way. What is the way? Give us in these last words a clear and simple and concise definition of the way to be with you. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, I'm the way. And I'm the truth of the life. And no man will come to the Father but by me. And satisfy Thomas. Then the next glimpse we have of Thomas, although he is not named, is in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is led away to be crucified. And we read a very, very tragic statement. Then all his disciples forsook him and fled. That is a tragic statement, isn't it? And the next thing in the word I should say that we do not see of Thomas is that the disciples are gathered in the upper room and Thomas is not there. Now the very opening statement of our text gives us some insight. Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Isn't that a sad statement? Because by the very fact that he is named one of the twelve, it indicates to me that the Holy Spirit is inferring that Thomas should have been there. Thomas, though he were saying in shock, one of the twelve was not with him. He was not present when Jesus came. Now, I say first of all that he should have been there. There isn't anything that should have kept him away. But you say, perhaps he didn't know that the Lord was going to come. But he didn't know. If you remember the women who came to the tomb early on Easter morning, Jesus appeared to them and he gave them a message. And you remember those women who heard from the mouth of that heavenly witness this message. Now you go and tell his disciples... And Peter, tell them three things. First, he is risen from the dead. Second, he goes before them. And third, they shall see. He even told them where to go. He said, go to Galilee. He is going to go before you into Galilee, and you'll see him there. No definite appointment was made. But they could have rested in this knowledge that Jesus would know where they were. Mary Magdalene came from the tomb, and that account of her incident tells us that she went directly to the eleven, which included Thomas, and told him, I have seen the Lord, and he said, I am ascending to my Father, and my God, your Father, and my God. They had every assurance that Jesus would meet with them, and I have no doubt whatever that the purpose of that assembly was in anticipation of the Lord's presence and of Him meeting them there. Now, they were not assembled for fear of the Jews. The doors were locked for fear of the Jews, but they were assembled because they had been told to get together and wait upon the Lord, and He would meet them. And I think that assembly was for the express purpose of the Lord Jesus coming to them to meet them in their need. 
And uh, if you want to know what the message is this morning, in case you haven't figured out yet, we're leading up to it very craftily. The subject of this message is why we ought to be in the assembly when it meets. And if I had to use a text, I'd take it from the book of Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. He told them, he, the word of God, that he would meet them. This was not an individual appearance he promised. It was an assembly appearance he promised to make. And Thomas knew this. Thomas also had received these messages. He may have had a good excuse, like some of us do. He may have had a fearful headache when it came that Easter Sunday evening. He may have been upset because of problems in his life, and he had some problems, which you will hear about in a moment. He may have felt that he would do more harm by coming to the assembly than he would have done good. And so, whatever his reason was, he came to the conclusion that Sunday evening, I will not go. I cannot go, or I must not go. I don't know what his words were, but the decision was the same, and that was to stay away from the assembly of the saints. Now I'm asking the question, and I'm going to answer it as best I can. Why? Why didn't he come? He knew the Lord would meet them. The Lord said he would. He had heard this from witnesses whose testimony couldn't be gainsaid. Why, do you think one look into Mary Magdalene's face would have left any doubt in Thomas's heart about the truthfulness of what she said? She said, I've seen the Lord. He's appeared to me. He told me this. Do you think one look into the faces of those women who had heard that message at the tomb would have left any doubts for Thomas? They said, oh, Thomas, it is so. He is risen. We saw the place where the Lord lay, and he's gone. The grave clothes are still there. Peter saw them. John saw them. But the Lord is gone, and he, oh, wonderful thing, Thomas, he's going to meet us. You better be at the meeting, Thomas. He's going to be there. He's going to meet us in Galilee. Don't forget to come to the assembly. But Thomas goes away with all of these things in his heart. And I think I know why Thomas didn't show up. I don't say that it was a valid excuse. I just say I think I know why he didn't come. Now, all man's ways are clean in his own eyes, and every time we stay away from the assembly, we always have what we feel is a bona fide excuse. There are very few times we could not be here if we wanted to be here, or if we would be here. A few exceptional times when perhaps we are not, absolutely not physically able to be here. But there are very few times indeed. Thomas, whatever his excuse was, I think I know the reason. Now, you know an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with lies. I don't know what his excuse was. Probably he had a tummy ache. Or maybe he says, i got to get up and go to work early Monday morning. I don't think I'll go tonight. But here was his reason, I'm sure. Thomas had made a statement. He made it in front of the disciples. He had made a boast in the presence of the assembly. He had given a testimony he couldn't live up to. And I know what spiritual pressure that puts on a believer. He had made the statement, I will go die with him. But when the opportunity came for him to fulfill what he had said and to do what he had promised, he fled in fear just like the rest of those disciples. It says they all forsook him. They all fled. I think Thomas was humiliated. I think Thomas was crushed because, as I have already shown you, I have reason to believe that Thomas did indeed truly love the Lord Jesus. And in the face of that love which he could not deny, he could not explain away the unbelief that made him forsake the Lord in the hour of his need 
and flee. Then I think spiritual pride worked on him. The pride that I can't go back to the assembly until I get straightened up with the Lord. I can't go back and face those disciples until I can look them in the eye and know that everything is right between me and the Lord. And oh, what foolish reasoning. The assembly was where he needed to be because the Lord Jesus had made promise to do something for that assembly. He did not promise any individual appearances. He promised an assembly appearance. Go tell them I will appear to them. In other words, Thomas should have come to the assembly expecting Christ to meet him and deal with him there. He doesn't come. And he missed something. Oh, you may say, I can afford to miss it. But Thomas couldn't afford to miss what he missed. I'll tell you what he missed. He missed, first of all, the revelation of the Lord Jesus in a new way to those who knew him. He knew the Lord. He'd seen him many times. He touched him. He'd eaten with him. He'd walked with him. Jesus was no stranger to Thomas. He knew him. Thomas might have said, I know him as well as anyone knows him. But not after that assembly. He couldn't say that. For he had never seen the Lord in the way he was seen that night when he appeared to those eleven. You remember how he appeared? He showed them something, his hands, and he sighed. He revealed his wounds, the meaning of the cross. He unfolded his person in a way that they had never seen him before in that manner and after that fashion. And they had gone back to Thomas and said, We've seen the Lord. And I can hear Thomas say, So what? I've seen him many times. But he had never seen them like they had seen him. For well, the Lord Jesus gave a special revelation of himself to that assembly that night. And believe you me, I don't think Thomas could have gone home and got it off his tape recorder. Do you know? I don't think he could. It wasn't in what Jesus said, it was in what he showed. It was in what was made plain to them that night in the assembly. They couldn't put that on tape. They couldn't save it for Thomas. At the very best, all they could do was tell Thomas what it was like. And at the very best, all Thomas could do was shake his head in unbelief. He not only missed a special revelation of the Lord Jesus himself, he missed something else. He missed seeing those precious wounds. Didn't he see them at the cross? Undoubtedly. But I don't think they were quite the same as they were after his resurrection. The wounds were now bloodless. They were not gory. They were not a repulsive thing as they once had been. Those wounds took on new meaning. They were open yet, and they never will be healed. The scripture is dogmatic on this. But they take on new meaning now, for he helped to explain them. He held them forth, and he said, Peace unto you. I'll tell you what Thomas missed. He missed a revelation of, the, of Christ himself. He missed the unveiling of his wounds in a new meaning. And he missed having his heart set at peace by the Lord Jesus. And he missed that gladness that the disciples knew when they saw the Lord that night in the assembly. Oh, let me tell you. Nothing else can make up for that loss. To me, it was an eternal loss. He missed the person of the Lord, the meaning of the wounds. He missed peace being given him by the Lord and that joy of the Lord which the Lord Jesus spoke and gave to the soul. 
Something happened in those disciples' lives. They didn't just come and sit in the assembly that night, see the Lord and the wounds and have peace and joy and then go out and say, good, we have peace and joy. Their lives took on a whole new direction because of what they saw and heard in the assembly that night. They went out of there with a whole new perspective on their life, for he had commissioned them to go under divine escort and under the power of the Holy Spirit to take the message of the remission of sins to others. They left the upper room prepared in their hearts in a new way for the days that lay ahead. They came to that assembly frightened. They came there with their minds on the Jews. But they came in faith believing that Jesus would meet them. That he would prepare them for the days ahead. He would give them peace and joy that they would see in a way that would satisfy their hearts. And they were not disappointed. If Thomas stayed home, he may have seen Bonanza, but he didn't see the Lord. He may have stayed home and had his stomach full, but his heart wasn't full. He was in worse shape than he was before. Now, I'd like to follow the pattern in Thomas' life. The assembly's over. I see Thomas going down the street on Monday. <laughs> he's looking a little sheepish because he just knows sooner or later he's going to run into one of them disciples. And they're going to ask that question which all disciples ask, and it is a leading question. Uh, were you sick yesterday? <laughs> and Thomas just hates to go down to the marketplace Monday because he knows sooner or later he's going to run into one of them guys. And he does. He's not disappointed. In fact, according to the language here, he ran into all of them at once, which was really bad. Because <laughs> it was the other disciples that told him about the meeting. Maybe that the other disciples were gathered together on a street corner talking, and here come Thomas down the street. He's looking for a knot hole to crawl in, and he can't find it. He's looking for some crack in the sidewalk to cover him, and he can't. So the disciples say to him, Hiya, Thomas. Hello, Brother Tom. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Missed you last night. Yeah, I know. Maybe they were polite like they ought to be and didn't ask him why. They just said, We missed you last night, and they did miss him. It's the truth of the body. Can't be a single believer gone without being missed. You know, I don't remember faces too well. I go home from the meeting, I don't know who specifically wasn't there. I know this, some weren't there. I know there was something missing. Although I couldn't tell you the faces or the names, I could tell you someone wasn't there. There was something lacking. We missed you last night, Thomas. Yeah, I know. Oh, Thomas, you ought to have been there. <laughs> and old Matthew speaks up, Tom. Would you believe? We saw the Lord. Thomas, we saw him. Oh, it was wonderful. Oh, we came there last night. We're so discouraged. We were so heartbroken and downcast. And Thomas, we just come because we had the promise of the Lord that he'd meet with us. He said he wouldn't leave us comfortless, and we needed to be comforted. That's the reason we were in that assembly last night. He said, go into Galilee, and there they will see me. And we were waiting. Thomas, it was wonderful. He came. And he showed us his hands and he showed us his side. And we understood it in a way we've never understood it before. And we saw him in a way we've never seen him. And oh, Thomas, you know, we left that meeting last night. We had such peace. We had such joy. You know what we're doing out here today, Thomas? <laughs> he breathed on us. And we came away walking in the Spirit as we had never known how before. And we're out here telling men how to have their sins remitted. Thomas didn't know anything about this because he wasn't walking in the Spirit. And 
He didn't have the peace and the joy it was granted in that assembly the night before. And he didn't have the light and the understanding and the perspective that those disciples had when they saw the Lord. And he wasn't down there with those other disciples. Now here is the sorry progression in Thomas's life. After he had heard patiently what they had to say about the assembly, I've always believed that he said in a rather irritated, hyper-spiritual, perhaps, attitude, and yet in his heart a longing to actually do just what he said. He said, well, I'll tell you one thing. You may have seen the Lord in the assembly last night, and you may have joy, and you may have peace, you may have new direction and feel that you're walking in the Spirit, but I'll tell you one thing. Not till I touch those wounds in his hand and put my hand in his side will I believe. You know what he was doing? Lifting himself by his own bootstraps as much to say, you didn't do that. Maybe you were deceived. Maybe you just didn't see what you thought you saw or know what you think you know. I'll tell you something. I'll make a more thorough investigation. Faith doesn't need a more thorough investigation. Faith is satisfied with what it sees in the heart. It doesn't need to thrust its hand into the wound in his side. Here is the progression. Failure in Thomas's life to live up to what he had said he would do to live the kind of testimony he gave in the presence of other believers, brought about, I believe, discouragement in his heart. And I believe that discouragement he felt would be helped if he absented himself from the assembly. And his absence from the assembly resulted in disbelief. I will not believe. And when Jesus came, as you will hear tonight, he told him, be not faithless, and he warned him. For in that statement was a warning that if he continued, he would fall into a fixed state of unbelief about the things he had once been so sure about. You just say what you will this morning, but I was never so sure of anything in my life when I tell you I know this to be an actual fact. Do you know it? You get to looking at the failure in your life. Just take a look within and see how many times you've let the Lord down, like Thomas did. Forsook him and fled after you had made the boast you never would. Just see how you failed in the eyes of other believers. Get to looking at that, and I'll tell you what you'll do. The first thing you'll do is you'll become so discouraged with what you see in yourself, you'll be too ashamed, like Thomas, to show up at the assembly. And so you'll sit home, nurse your poor old wounds, and lick your poor old sores. And when men tell you about the joy and the peace that they had in seeing Jesus, you'll find that you won't believe them. If you continue in such a state and the Lord doesn't straighten you out, it will become a fixed state of unbelief, and you may never come back to the assembly. I didn't get this out of my head. I got this out of the scriptures. I'm reading it here in the life of Thomas. I saw it. I saw it happen with him. He was a disciple and he fell because he didn't take heed unto himself. When he saw the failure in his life, he needed the assembly as he never needed it before. Didn't he? He needed the ministry of Christ in the assembly as he never needed it before. But instead of admitting his need... He said, I'll stay away, and everything will be all right, and I want to tell you something. He suffered a terrible experience. He fell into disbelief, I will not. He became stubborn, hard-headed, and stiff-necked. And I am confident that he must have found fault with everybody in the assembly to give himself excuse to continue to stay away.
I can't stand that Peter every time I'm around him. Oh, he talks about his peace and joy and things like that. <laughs> you ever see a disciple in this fix? Boy, I have. He can't stand anybody that's been with the Lord. He won't stand it for long. He's either got to get straightened out or get away from that fellow right away. All he does is just stand around spouting off peace and joy. <laughs> All he does is just talk about seeing the Lord and knowing about his wounds and, and uh, going out here in the power of the Holy Spirit and talking to people about having their sins remitted. I tell you, I don't want to be around them guys. And it got so bad that I'll tell you what this disbelief is. You think it may be a minor thing. It is a very grievous thing in the eyes of the Lord. It demands, before long, feelings instead of faith. Thomas came to the place where he wouldn't believe unless he could feel the wounds in Jesus' hand and feel the wound in his side. I don't feel like coming to the assembly. And until I feel something real from the Lord, then I'll just stay away. This was Thomas' feelings. For he was now a feeler. And all his thoughts was on one thing. He must feel a certain way before he could believe. Right? No. It's true. You say, well, isn't that good? It's good with one exception. Jesus was willing to let him feel. Offered him his hand and his side. How would you like to have a wound in your side so large it would accommodate a man's hand? How would you like to have that wound only three days old? And how would you like to have a man thrust his hand into it? Would it hurt? Yes, the feelings that Thomas demanded were also going to produce some feelings as far as Jesus was concerned. Because this kind of disbelief hurts the Lord. It hurts him. He'll satisfy you if he must, but it will hurt him in doing it. Shame on us. God knows how many times we've forced the Lord to give us feelings before we will believe him. So, and we've hurt him. We've hurt him. Isn't his word enough? Did he not send to Thomas unmistakable testimony in the lives of those who had seen the Lord? Couldn't he have taken them at their word? No. Because when a man breaks faith with Jesus, he breaks faith with Jesus' people too. The man that can't believe Jesus will never believe the disciples. A man in Thomas' circumstances who has rejected the ministry of the assembly, he has also rejected in his heart the personal testimonies of the people in that assembly. That's the reason why when I see some of you go through Thomas's experience, I never ring your doorbell nor dingle your telephone. Because all I told you in private would be greeted with the same unbelief that Thomas greeted the private testimony of those who had been in the assembly. When your heart is not right with the Lord, it will not be right with the assembly. And when your heart is not right with the Lord and not right with the assembly, it can never be right with the individual persons in that assembly. Their hearts were right with Thomas. They wanted to share with him what the Lord had given him in the assembly, but he could not receive it. He could not receive it because he could not receive the assembly. And he could not receive the assembly because he had found in his heart that he could not receive the Lord. He had broken fellowship with Jesus, and in so doing, he had broken fellowship with the saints. Where was he that Sunday night? I don't know where he was. I know what he was. Miserable. I know something else he was. All alone. 
nursing his wounds, licking his sores, satisfying himself with excuses, reasons. And I'll tell you something, he suffered because of it. Eight real, long, difficult days before anything was done about it. Eight long days. But I noticed that eight long days was enough. And uh, the next Sunday night, Thomas shows up. Or the next meeting night, rather. Eight days. After eight days, Thomas shows up. I believe he must have come around expecting the Lord to do something about his own heart. And the Lord did, because there just wasn't anybody there that night but Jesus and Thomas. That's what you'll hear about tonight. Do you suppose that he was home reading his Bible? <laughs> no, if he had been home reading his Bible, he would have showed up in the assembly. Because everything he would have read in the Word would have increased his desire to have been with the saints. And to have been where Jesus might possibly have ministered to his heart. Now, what I'm trying to say is something that I'm sure you'll misunderstand if I don't say it real plain. Of course, there is personal communion between the saints and the Lord Jesus. Of course, there is personal fellowship in the Word between the Lord Jesus and the saints. But there is also a ministry performed by Christ through the assembly of saints that he will not perform in private. He could have appeared to Thomas in his bedroom just as easily as he appeared in that room with the disciples. But he didn't. Thomas never shared what was shared in the assembly. Thomas never learned what was learned that night in the assembly. Thomas never knew what was known that night. He never heard Jesus say, as he breathed on him the Holy Spirit, whose sins you remit, they are remitted. That was lost and it was gone forever. Oh yes, Thomas was restored. And Thomas sobbed out his faith, as you will hear tonight, when he came back to the assembly and Jesus confronted him with his word, dealt with his heart, and brought him to that confession. But he missed something that he could never regain. And as I've so often told you, I can only tell you again by way of testimony. I believe in the purpose, in the ministry, in the gifts, in the office of the New Testament Assembly. I believe it is the means that the Lord Jesus uses to do something for the assembly as an assembly that he will not do in private and personal communion. I do not ask him why he wants to do it this way. I simply find in his word that he does. There is grace ministered for the days ahead in the assembly that will not be ministered through personal fellowship. There is a special application of the word made that is not made in private and personal fellowship. Now, I don't say that there is an exclusive uh, monopoly upon truth in the assembly. I'm just saying that there is new truth in the assembly. There is new revelation of the Lord, and there is new grace, and there is new ministry that cannot be obtained privately. This is taught in Ephesians 4. It is demonstrated in the life of Thomas. For if Thomas had been as successful as believers would like to make us feel they are in abandoning the assembly for personal fellowship, he would have said to those disciples the next day, Oh, did you? Really? Well, well, well. Well, you know, I had a more blessed time than you had last night. Oh, you know, I was there all alone last night by myself at home, didn't feel like coming to the assembly. And the Lord appeared to me. And he showed me his wounds. And he spoke peace to me, and he filled me with joy, and he breathed on me and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, go out and remit men's sins. And they would have said, Is that so? That same thing happened to assembly last night. And so all those disciples went away, and they said, Well, there's no use us ever meet together again, brethren. 
just save ourselves the trouble and save ourselves the time, and we'll just all go off in the corner somewhere next Sunday night, and we'll all have the same experiences, and we won't ever need to see each other again. Christ is in the believer. And even though he is in every believer, he is manifested in his body in the assembly. And there is something of Christ that I will miss and something of Christ I will never get unless I make use and available my, avail myself and appropriate to myself the means of grace that he has given in the assembly. This may sound like theology, but I think it's very practical, and I think if you will think back in your own experience, you will know that everything I've told you is true. Don't you know? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this truth, and we pray that this morning you would put this truth not in our heads, but in our hearts. Father, if we would pray for any specific thing for the assembly as such, we pray this, that there will be that holy realization that you do meet with us from time to time and that you prepare our hearts for the days ahead through special application of the word and that this is a means of grace supplied to the body from the head, even Jesus. We thank you for it and we thank you for the innumerable times that we have proven the truthfulness of this message. Thank you for the innumerable times that we have seen him in the assembly of received of his peace and his joy and a new direction in our lives and a preparation for the days ahead that made life joyful and made life real. Bless those who were here this morning. May they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, whatever he would personally and privately want to say to them through this message. We pray in Jesus' name before I say, Amen. Lord bless you.